Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of the official New Japan Pro Wrestling English podcast. The only and therefore the best official English source on everything related to New Japan past, present and future. I am your host today. My name is Chris Charlton and I am joined by another big name. Well, your name will be big. <laughs> up in lights, my guest or my co-host for this experience will be Michael Craven. I'm the general manager of New Japan Pro Wrestling responsible for the international division. Now, Chris, thank you for inviting me on this podcast. And well, thank you for organizing this. Well, actually, podcast, this audible experience, audible experience. Uh, indeed. I know that you have a full slate of topics for us today. And yeah. first I'd like to ask a little bit more about yourself, Chris. Can you tell all of our new viewers a little bit about yourself? All of our new viewers <laughs> this, on this audible content. But no, we'll, we'll put it on YouTube and then it'll all be fine. Um, yes. No, well, no, I think people know who I am a little bit, right? You know, because uh, I've been visible, I suppose, uh, on the internet, uh, translating content. And then, uh, you know, I started with New Japan and on the broadcast team last July during the G1 and it's gotten busier and busier ever since. And now I'm looking at May and going, holy crap, uh, there's lots of exciting things going on. Um, but you know, I think name aside, you know, maybe people might have seen your name written down, but they might not necessarily know who you are beyond a figure within New Japan. I think like a lot of people see, uh, you know, on the business side of pro wrestling and they envisage kind of suits and people that aren't so connected to the business, but you've been connected with, uh, pro wrestling for a long time, right? I have indeed. Um, well, first if my memories go back all the way back to the 1980s, uh, with VHS cassettes, my father, used to work in Japan and he would come back always with a New Japan Pro Wrestling a VHS. And when I got older, I was probably one of the youngest tape traders in Canada. Around the age of 12, I was trading cassette tapes with other Canadians that somehow made their way across the border to even America. Um, I like to think I was the source of many of the matches that you see uploaded illegally now on, on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of like your headache to get those matches illegally. Yeah, well, well, we're not going to mention that right now. <laughs> I'm actually trying to get some of those matches up on World. That's the bigger challenge. Well, that's the big thing. You know, that's that's what we want. And so the the kids these days, it sounds awful. And like the first episode of this podcast where yeah. we're going kids these days, but... Um, you don't they, they don't know the struggles we had or the struggles that you had and the struggles that I had, you know, but in, in the times before illegal things on YouTube and before proper legitimate streaming services that we have now. Well, Chris, what made you a wrestling fan? Um, geez, what made me a wrestling fan was it sounds all, you know, I was a little bit too late for world of sport. Yes. Uh, being British. And so I came in on WCW Saturday nights, oh. WCW World Web in a decent ish phase. But, you know, but that's when, so I got Sting and, and yes. you know, Sting and Vader, which I mean, you know, Vader in WCW, step above. Yeah. But, you know, not quite where he was in, in, in New Japan. Of course. Before of that. Course. Um, but what got me involved in New Japan was a, a trader tape. It yes. might have been one of yours. I don't know. But, but <laughs> went around the seas, but uh, probably a little bit after your time. Because this was, I remember distinctly, it must have been about 99, 2000 that I saw it. And uh, my brother came and visited with a, a magical video cassette with a, a printed label that said 1994 Super Jacob. I was still having tapes. At that point, I was in university and I was still watching New Japan. I was still getting tapes from Japan at that point. When I came to, 19, to Japan in 1998, it was a little bit different because New Japan wasn't easily accessible as it was, once was, is what my father said. Mm. Um, it went from a golden, uh, what, what do you call golden, it? The golden time, they golden call it. Time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very prime time. And then sort of at 88, yeah. it went from that to Saturdays at 4 p.m., right? Yeah. So And then, yeah. And so that kind of surprised me because when I came to Japan, I was expecting to see it at a certain time and it was on a strange time for me. So. Mm. But then again, you know, it's it was easily accessible and it was nice to see it live also too. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean it it spoke volumes about 
the boom that was going on in 97 and 98, where it wasn't necessarily the prime time from TV boom. No. It was the, the live experience was doing phenomenal numbers and, and of course, like the merchandise because you had, of course, of course, this was the NWO, yeah. <laughs> NWO Japan, uh, boom, which was its own thing. You know, I mean, closer now to Los Ingobernables, De Habon, I think, you know, or Bullet Club, you know, obviously, but uh, I think Bullet Club exceeded NWO though, at least in Japan. In the end, it did. In the yeah. end, even yeah. t-shirt think, sales wise. Right. I'd have right. to say it, it, it exceeded. Right. Because of, I think, because of the global expansion, yeah. right? And my biggest surprise was the first event I went to in America. That was actually all in. Oh, yeah. And this, my first event as general manager in New Japan mm. for wrestling, mm. that was backstage. All in was a sea of black. Mm. I well, I think a golf party. Every sort of, <laughs> yeah, every <laughs> wrestling experience you go around the world, it was interesting. You know, when Taiji Ishimori came into New Japan. Yes. And he was doing this interview of, well, why did you choose Bullet Club? I was like, well, they're the most famous, right? <laughs> <laughs> when, when he did, uh, PWG and those Indies in, uh, in America, he went over his YouTube. Everybody was wearing Bullet Club shirts. Yes. He was like, get in on that, make yourself most famous, you know, and, and good on the kid. But yeah, I mean, my first experience was the first match I remember was Jushin Thunder Liger and Hayabusa. And you imagine like, uh... oh my God, this entirely different world of wrestling. Um, the, the colorful masks, the speed, the pace, the athleticism, the fact that within the first thing Hayabusa does is this like Topi Kong Hidota, uh, Jushin Laigo on the floor. And, um, so me, I think for a lot of wrestling fans, you know, and we came past Jushin Thunder Liger's 30th anniversary match yes. this past week. Actually, as we're sitting down and recording this, it was just yesterday. And, um, I said at the time, you know, Jushin Thunder Liger is wrestling, is Japanese pro wrestling to so many people. But more than that, like he is Japan. So, so he's a, he's not just an ambassador for no. our medium. He's an ambassador for this country. Would you consider him Japan's greatest wrestling export? Um, see, that's a tough one. I think. You, I mean, you could say that with someone like a Muta, that was like a mutual, it was a symbiotic kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Where but still, America you know, helped make Muta, you know, and, yeah, and vice but versa. Muta on but Liger, there's a difference in name was, value, though. Oh, but I no mean, disrespect to Muta. I think the name value, maybe you could debate, and, and it's another thing with tenure, you know, yes. and how far he went, but it was more that Liger had his his persona, you know, I hesitate to say the word brand because it's a yes. hate word, but like, you know, um, he had that and then was able to export it, you know, and, and it was, uh, like I said on commentary the other night, you know, it's that wonderful phrase that doesn't quite translate, but in the Japanese announcers called him Sekai no Jushin, like, mm. it, because everything who he is translates to absolutely everyone, everywhere, new fans, old fans, it's uh, it's unique. Well, he's definitely one of the most innovative, influential, and most important junior heavyweights to ever grace any wrestling ring. Yeah. Um, most notable are his IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championships between May of 1989, December 1999. He won the championship 11 times, which is also a record. He also holds the record for most days as champion. Well, I mean, two, two thousand, over two thousand days. You know, I mean, you're getting there to, yeah. he held it total well, for more than six years. Yes. My well, six oldest friends. son isn't six <laughs> years old. Yet. You know, so I mean, like, he was, it goes, I think it goes beyond, like, you can read that list of statistics, you know, and go in this and, and a tremendous Wikipedia page. Well, but it's, it's more than that. You know, he, it is just, he, communicates so well and it was so difficult um it's so difficult to pin down well what's your favorite Liger situation you know I mean Liger and Naoki Sano Liger and Kuniaki Kobayashi you know mm. um or you know into that era in the 90s where it was just there was such a depth yes and not just in Japan but all over the world not just in New Japan but a lot of other companies and then so you had like a working with Ultimo Dragon, with Great Sasuke, with Shinjiro Otani, with Ko Koji Kanemoto, like the, 
you know, you're, you're looking there at a list of names that are the best to ever do it, and then Liger is the best of those best. Well, Liger is probably one of the best that's ever pinned Jericho. I remember Jericho recently <laughs> saying he's never, <laughs> been, he's never been pinned by a Japanese, and uh, guess what? He has been. <laughs> he has been, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, Liger all the way up to the current day and picking fights with Minoru Suzuki. Very, very true. Oh, well. It was one do of you those... Do you remember... Uh, his uh, competition in mixed martial arts? His fight with Suzuki in, in Pancras. Yeah, it's a, a very brief match. Let's well, face it. I mean, he it was... a one-sided bout. But he was... Liger wasn't supposed to take the fight. Oh. It wasn't supposed to be his fight to take, right? It, I mean, the, originally it was... Um, Suzuki was finishing up his mixed martial arts career. Uh, you know, there was this situation where we want to do something with New Japan and Pancras. Yes. And so a port of call was Kensuke Sasaki, who's, I mean, God, Kensuke Sasaki, is, yeah, right? He's a tough bastard, right? Um, but Sasaki had injuries. You know, was he in? Was he out? That was the decision, you know. So the, the, the talk, as I understand it, was, uh, the higher ups, you know, Liger talks about it in his book. I believe it was like Uwai at the time. Yeah. And so the, the conversation came to Liger, could we maybe, you know, if it came down to it, would you be willing? And Liger just instantly, yeah. You know, because if I duck it, it looks like New Japan's ducking it. And then it makes the, you know, he bore that responsibility for the whole, uh, promotion at that point. And then it sort of came to Liger going to Sasaki saying, you know, if you duck this fight, you know, it's going to look really bad. Right? <laughs> yeah. So Sasaki then goes, okay, I'll do it. But that gets back up. And then they said, well, Pancras have already <laughs> they made the posters. They made the tickets. So, um, well, Suzuki at the time was going in with a record of 28, 28 to 19 going into the fight with victories over Ken Shamrock, Maurice Smith, Matt Hume. But so, I mean, beyond that, he was, he is the, uh, you know, what fans might not realize is a founding father of not just mixed martial arts in Japan, MMA period, right? True. Because when you think, you know, he, I mean, he originated in New Japan, was an Antonio Inoki devotee, was his personal assistant, you know, and was set for great things. Yes. <laughs> Had he continued, made that decision, you know, because he was trained by Yoshiaki Fujiwara. And wanted to stay close to his trainer, Carl Gotch, a very big devotee or whatever. So, you know, he made that call to go to UWF. Um, and UWF fell apart quite quickly. Lots of sort of combustible elements. Yes. And, um, that begat another thing with Fujiwara and that begat Pancras and Pancras without Pancras. You know, you could say their relationship with UFC would have meant, you know, without Pancras, would we have a UFC? Without Pancras, would Ken Shamrock have been a big star? You know, I was in Japan at the time when, oh, this, yeah. when this belt happened, and I heard about this belt, and I actually had a chance to see it live. <laughs> and I regret actually not going to it. Of course. Yeah. But <laughs> at the time, I had reservations of seeing a wrestler versus a mixed martial artist, hmm. because I figured it would always be a one-sided belt. And of course, hearing that Suzuki did a rear naked choke and tapped him out in less than two minutes, yeah, kind of confirms that. Yeah, it it was more. I mean, I think there was no dispersions as to how it would end, but it was the showing up, of course, that was most important, and it was that, and like Suzuki himself would never admit it. But when the music hits and here comes Jushin Liger, and yes. like, yeah, everybody erupting as they still do today. That's what made Suzuki have decide. You, have you watched the match in its entirety? I have, yeah. Did you watch the end of the match? Yeah. Um, and the mic performances. And there you go. And yeah, and like, it was all of that that prompted Suzuki, I want to get back into yeah. the wrestling game. And Liger then saying, give me a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it again. And that's why Suzuki is saying now, well, it's been more than a couple of years. Why don't we? But Liger, in the other hand, saying, well, 
yeah, but I mean, Pancras, they didn't allow like steel chair shots yeah. <laughs> and everything that's been going on with those two. So um, that's put us where we are now, where it's kind of an interesting situation. Liger wants to finish Suzuki's career before he ends his own. Suzuki will never retire. Yeah, but I, yeah, there's people like Suzuki and even Yoshiaki Fujiwara is still. <laughs> he's still out there today every single opportunity that man has every single opportunity Suzuki has he might have to leave New Japan though if Liger if he gets in this situation you could the stars align you know and, and certainly if if the rules work to Liger's favour yes if it's a uh, Pro wrestling, like, you know, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say because they have, they both have such diverse breeds of professional wrestling. And their styles are completely different. And they're both pro wrestling. Yeah. Right. It's hard to say, okay, well, let's do it in pro wrestling rules than like in MMA yeah. rules than Suzuki rules. No, because they're both pro wrestling, but there's such different faces of it. And that's like another thing that these, uh, ideologies that are buying heads that, that makes this really compelling. But well, I can say that from my personal experiences, Suzuki is absolutely terrifying. Yeah, oh yeah. I would not want to be in Liger's shoes. No, but it was, yeah. Oof. Jeez. Yeah, but I mean, Liger, you can't really talk about Liger without talking about his contributions to the junior heavyweight division. Very true. Best of the Super Juniors is coming up. Uh, very, very soon, you yeah. know, always on the horizon. There's always something coming up, uh, you know, right around the corner in New Japan. And, um, the is big... there anyone you're looking forward to watching? Jeez. Well, okay. Let's, uh, I will run down the list for you. All right. In a, in a big, long, so deep breath. Here. We have, here we go. Ryusuke Taguchi, Tiger Mask, Rocky Romero, Show, Yo, Will Ospreay, Taiji Ishimori, El Desperado, Taka Michinoku, uh, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, Bushi, uh, we've got Flip Gordon, uh, we have Titan, Mighty Skull, Ultimo Dragon, uh, Ultimo Dragon, there's a, there's a flub, Dragon Lee, <laughs> Dragon Lee, I got that one up. Uh, we've got Robbie Eagles, we've got Jonathan Gresham, Bandido, Shingo Takagi, and a mystery participant. Mystery, mystery participant. Mystery. Yeah, it's one of those things where we've seen those videos. Yeah. So you get, it's not quite the situation where we had with Ishimori last year. I Very think that's true. what's interesting where Ishimori, we just saw a bone soldier and we're like, who's that? What? Well, you know, the, and I think now we've got, I think the people who know have an yeah. idea and now we're waiting for, yo, what confirmation will that be? And then what that translates to as it comes to actually competing in the ring here in New Japan. It, it's so. interesting because last, the best of the super juniors, I was a fan. Mm. And now I'm watching with a different set of eyes. Right. And it's strange being on the other side of the fence because I still want to watch as a fan would. <laughs> and I still try to enjoy as a fan. Yeah. But at the same time, as in your role, and I know like you communicate a lot with the talent. So at your point now, you're watching as a fan, but you're also saying, Oh my God, I hope nobody gets hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah. So it's a, it's a different, and it's a different situation for me from where I'm watching as a fan. And, well, and I'm, I'm watching, thinking, I'm saying, hoping nobody lands in my lap. Yeah, now, you know, I'm hoping, Oh my God, I hope Chris doesn't get hurt. You're right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I believe we had one of those calls recently. Uh, well, yeah, my God, I'm getting picked on all over the place. It's, uh, it's a, it's a rough one. Well, May second, I mean, it's the Bullet Club's anniversary. I don't. Yeah, yeah. May and Bullet Club. Yeah, and I'm going to be in for Coco as well. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, yeah. I so, wonder who made that match? <laughs> oh, sorry, it wasn't a match. It's not. I know. Yeah, Ben Nobby. Um, but yeah, I mean, five debutants this year, which is first in a while that yes. we've had that many debutants. I mean, the biggest field that we've ever had twenty. Yes. Um. So then you look at. The new guy, it's always you look at the new guys in those fresh matchups, yes. and those are like really interesting. You know, I think, uh, Bandido, like in a new Japan ring, you're going to see more out Bandido than you've ever seen if you have seen him. And if you haven't seen him, then you're in for something great with Bandido. Robbie um, Eagles is somebody I'd like to talk about a little bit. Mm. Um, I've seen Robbie Eagles wrestle in Australia, and I can mm. say that new Japan fans haven't seen the best of him yet. Right. 
Um, Robbie Eagles is outstanding. Yeah, I, th- I, think- I expect him to do a lot more in the New Japan ring than people expect. I expect him to be definitely a rising star. And I think, again, those that know, know. Those that don't know, you're in for something special. Yes. Those that do know are looking at Will Ospreay on this list and are looking at Robbie Eagles on this list and are thinking, oh my God, if they're in the same block or if they're not in the same block, if they're at the final. And there's lots of guys that you can talk about that with. Yes. Well, I've seen an Eagles Osprey match. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Again, if you it's, know, yeah. you know, you know, and, and that's sort of really lit. I think, you know, Osprey should, you know, when somebody writes the book on Australian wrestling, <laughs> You know, yes. and, and that's not me, but, um, it might be me. I'm becoming an expert. Yeah, there you go. And, and you would circle around to a Will Ospreay doing so much as an advocate for yes. that scene. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think there's lots of situation, lots of fresh matchups. You look at John Gresham, who was tremendous in honor rising and there's very few people that, the, that a new audience, and the New Japan audience, you know, traditionally, especially in somewhere like, somewhere like Korokan Hall is like home yes. base for us. So like the fans are very knowledgeable there more than say in other markets that we go to more than Fukuoka, for example. Right. Um, because we're there so often. But even that said, when it's a sudden, Oh, we get this guy, you know, that was, I was there when Gresham made his debut and within 10 seconds being in the ring. He had his guys that were going to cheer him through this tournament. Um, so I think that's tremendous. And Shingo and Sho. That's the other, that's the other thing where you go same block or different block and final. Mm-hmm. You know, very true, very true. What I'd like to see though is there's only been one, Marty Squirrel. Marty Scullin. Yeah. And he's an interesting one because he's one of the few guys to ever quit the Bullet Club. And there's a couple of Bullet Club guys in this tournament. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't often, yeah, it's a difficult club to leave. During Bullet Club month. Different club to leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a different scenario. It's an interesting one. And like the, I think interesting as well is Skull is one of the people in this year's field. And I think there's more than ever where they, they're on that line between junior and heavyweight. Yes. And there's a lot of people, you know, we were talking just uh, well, earlier today. Before you were mentioning well. some, that somebody so, might make history this year. Well, there's a, may, there's a possibility out there. But I mean, no, it's never been done before where you have a New Japan Cup entrant go into Best of the Super Juniors and G1 in the same year. Yeah, see, I made a mistake because I thought Devitt had done that. But actually, right, Milano me. and Devitt both did yeah. the next year. So they did three in a row, but it was BOSJ G1. New Japan Cup. Um, but this year you have two because you have Toguchi. Yes. Who was uh, the substitute to Tenzan and was in the New Japan Cup, now best of the Super Juniors. Will Ospreay was in New Japan Cup, best of the Super Juniors. Um, Marty Skull could very easily be junior, could very easily be heavyweight. Um, Sho could be that. Shingo could absolutely be that. You know, we talk about it every time Shingo comes out. Um, so, you know, that's a very interesting scenario because I think the key this year is going to be versatility and those versatile performers that can do a little bit of everything, those are going to be the keys to victory as opposed to people that are all power, the people that are all flying. Yes. You know? So I think you're going to see a little bit of an edge towards um, maybe guys that haven't been around for a while that are coming back. Guys like Rocky Romero, guys like Takami Chinoku, they're a little bit... Don't underestimate the Titan. Titan as well, like, uh, what, first in six years, seven years? Yes. And uh, 25 six years, yeah. yeah. Um, and he's a guy that's gotten bigger recently. Yes. Right? And in those uh, bodybuilding competitions in yes. TML. and he's um definitely sized up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you well, know, in that interesting... An interesting position now for okay, what is junior heavyweight wrestling now, and what will it be in the future? Because um, you know, I, I think every that's that's what's interesting here is you're going to see the winner of this tournament, and then perhaps 
will they, won't they challenge for the title in uh, Osaka Joe Hall, which is, has been over the last few years. Usually the winner goes on. Um, normally they have a bit more time. You know, this yes. time it's like Wednesday to the Sunday, to the Saturday. So it's like a really tough Wednesday to Sunday, right? It's a very tough window. Um, but whether they do or whether they don't, how will they shape what the junior heavyweight division is, what junior heavyweight wrestling is going forward? So Indeed. I think we're on the cusp, just like everything in wrestling. It seems to be this year. Lots yes. of change. Uh, going on so it's uh, yeah it's a fascinating tournament I'm looking forward to it who's your pick who's my pick I already said my pick at the beginning yep. of the show your pick's Robbie Eagles Robbie Eagles sniper of the skies hmm yeah I think it's another one where we haven't seen him as a singles yet yeah you know and we saw a little bit just, just that little various hint uh, back on Horizon you know and that, but that was in Young Lion match it's a little bit different um, of course, my second pick would be Shimori. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dragon Lee's a top pick. You know what I mean? Dragon yeah. Lee. He's, uh, you know, I say I, I sort of made the, picks, I made the Freudian slip when we were sort of running down the line when I said yeah. Ultimo Dragon because, you know, Dragon Lee, like Ultimo Dragon, like a Jushin Liger, is someone that translates so quickly, so easily. Of course. With so much instant visual impact to, everywhere he goes in the world yes and uh, you know and there was that picture of him because he's he's got four titles in mexico right? yes so he's out there with the two and you know the famous ultimo dragon with the the j crown and like all of his eight belt, you know and he had 10 belts at one stage and meanwhile um, we have tamo with the santa claus sack well yeah yeah that's if yano doesn't Make off with everything. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I seem to notice Yano always leaves one pair of belts behind. I don't know why that is. And it seems to be as, as interested in. In one set, it seems that nobody's that interested in. I think, like, Tangalo is the only guy that's protecting them. So, you know, <laughs> like, we best, you know, Tamatonga's playing Butterfingers with all of those. Oh, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. So okay, scratched and dented. Yeah, yeah. We've got to be careful with that, you oh. know, just in case. You might have to foot the bill in the oh, end of the day. Oh, I might be the one saying sorry for all this mess. Yeah, 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 right. Um, so, yeah. So, there was Best of the Super Juniors. Best of the Super Juniors is, like, well, a tournament. Of course. Yeah. But uh, the reason why I say that is we, we say tournament. We use the, the tournament word in our Japanese listings as well. You always say tournament thought, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, it's one thing I think what I would like to do with this, this podcast we go on is educate the fans. Uh, are you talking about the word taikai? Yeah, because <laughs> it used to be a thing. It's become less of a thing now. Yes. But a couple of years ago, it would be the thing on Twitter. Everybody would, you know, when there wasn't, when there were fewer English resources for New Japan. Yes. Channel, when there wasn't an international version, when there wasn't an English website, it would be the Japanese website fed through Google Translate. Oh God. By somebody, you know, oh, in, in America. And then here comes, what's going on? You know, somebody, somebody would reach out to me and say, like, what's yes. this tournament going on? <laughs> because, um, the Japanese word taikai is, is what we use and what any other wrestling promotion uses to refer to a particular event or card, you know? Yes. Right? So, uh, yeah, very often we'll talk about, oh, the, the Hiroshima Taikai, you know, coming up on Friday. Yes. It's the Hiroshima card. But, uh, yeah, Taikai in certain contexts can translate to tournament. Tournament. And then your auto translate reflects on that. So that's your word for today. Taikai is card. Yes. Yeah. If you wrote it down, it would be big meeting. So <laughs> that's, that's my, yeah. So from the small meeting room in the New Japan. The very cities. small meeting room today. Yeah, well, you know, we can make magic in small spaces. Oh, I hope so. You're making magic right now, Chris. I hope to continue. I hope we both get to continue making magic um, on the on this New Japan English podcast. And I hope, before you wrap up, that the people listening to our words can create a little bit of magic for us. Oh, that are you requesting something for our fans? I think so, you know, because, uh, you know, this is the first thing. We don't know where it's going to go from here. You know, we, we have to, everything goes through. You've been telling me procedures, right? And yeah, procedures and approvals. But we're missing something from this podcast, Chris. Yes, exactly. Something very critical. Yeah, we want, uh, some, some music 
from uh, uh, from uh, our fans. You know, I thought it'd be a good idea to crowdsource. What do we want? Well, um, if you guys could put together a 10 second, I think no more than 10 seconds, something nice, something nice, something short, something snappy, uh, something entirely musical, I think. Uh, you know, I don't think we need lyrics or anything like that. No, but a nice no. little 10 second jingle. And uh, if you put that, wrap it up in a bow, smack it on the bottom and uh, send it to, where can they send it to? That was a thing we should have thought about first. Uh, there'll be a link uh, with this podcast. Right. So we'll sort it out then. Uh, or you can send it to uh, us directly, perhaps over social media. Uh, you can get in touch with uh, me personally on social media. I'm at Reason JP. Or probably the best bet for your jingles and little snazzes and bits would be to put it onto the New Japan Global Twitter at NJPW Global, which is hair raisingly close to the 100,000 mark right now. Very true, very true. Yeah. So of course you also definitely want to go to njpw1972.com for all the news and all the happenings going along around New Japan as well as your chance to buy tickets to events coming up not just in Japan but internationally such as... Well you're mentioning Osprey and how he would be in the book for Austra- the Australian wrestling scene. We have a show, uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling Southern Showdown in Melbourne on June 29th, and tickets will be on sale at the time of this podcast, and also the secondary show in Sydney at the Roundhouse on June 30th. We have the G1 Dallas opening on July 6th, and the first event I've ever made, New Japan Pro Wrestling Royal Quest on August 31st at the Copper Box. Thrilling things coming down the pipes uh, in New Japan and on and on through Best of the Super Juniors, through G1, through pretty soon Double Dome in the Tokyo Dome. <laughs> so much to get going on and so much I'm sure that we'll be talking about on this podcast should it continue. So until next time. So in the meantime, in the in-between time, that's it for our first edition of the New Japan Podcast. And go kigen yo. Sayonara.